Then it is the fourth, um, fourth state of matter or not. Um, actually, this is kind of misleading um, because we don't see any real phase, tra uh, phase transition between the gas and the plasma. And uh, if you talk about ionization, the transition ionization can happen uh, by simply uh, following the ultraviolet radiation. As we see in the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere is uh, usually ionized due to ultraviolet radiation uh, and uh, a plasma exists there. But um, if, if, so we, we, can, we can understand it uh, through an example. Let's take the example of water. Um, if you talk about the different the states of water, Starting from solid, uh, we can say the 100, um, 273 73 degree Kelvin. We see a major phase transition from solid to liquid in water. And at 273 degree Kelvin, liquid to gas. Um, but we don't see any real transition once we reach the gaseous form of the water. Although we, we, we keep increasing the temperature to thousands of Kelvin, but then obviously 10,000 Kelvin, it, it starts to dissociate and around the 100,000 Kelvin, the, um, uh, the water molecule or the, the atoms in the molecule, basically they start ionizing. So um, starting from real transitions at uh, zero degree centigrade, 100 degree centigrade, and then later on, we don't really see a real phase uh, transition as we can see in solid liquid gas. So um, Plasma is basically a kind of gas, ionized gas that exists everywhere. This is what we can uh, easily define how the plasma is. So, so some people may disagree, but, but um, I, I see it like this. Um, where, where is it plasma I mean, in the universe? If you just uh, have a big picture, starting from the uh, upper atmosphere. So roughly upper atmosphere ionization starts around 90 kilometers above the Earth's surface which is the start of the ionosphere. Then we have magnetosphere, obviously, in the, in the magnetic uh, sphere of the Earth. We, we have a lot of it uh, entering from the, uh, through the solar wind. And then obviously it's the solar wind, which, which, is, um, which is everywhere between this, our star sun and all the planets. So interplanetary space, uh, it's, it's, it's full of plasma. Then we go beyond. Uh, between stars, obviously, all these stars uh, are, um, are boiling giants of gas uh, and charged gas. So inter uh, inter interstellar space is also full with, with plasma and also intergalactic space. So it, it, it's just a matter of what is the density of the plasma and uh, what is the temperature of the plasma in certain parts of the galaxy. But you cannot just say that this is the part where plasma does not exist. So generally, we have it everywhere. Um, today we are going to talk about the closest vicinity, uh, closest source of plasma for us, for the Earth, which is the Sun, um, which is our star. So generally talking about um, just the, uh, the biometer of the Sun could be like, it is 109 times the diameter of the Earth. So this is kind of size comparison. The mass comparison is like 333,000 of the Earth mass is actually the mass of the Sun. But obviously, the density is very, very low because sun is a uh, sun is a, is is mostly a gas sphere, gas is sphere full of plasma, uh, and Earth we have uh, as we see we have solid and other um, form of matter also available. Um, sun has a different temperature, obviously, uh, since the plasma exists on, uh, in, on the sun and the near sun environment has different temperature and pressure. So um, it, basically this temperature um, determines at what frequency the light can be emitted uh, uh, from these plasma structures. So we have to change our perspective in terms of, in terms of wavelength in order to see the depth uh, as, 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 as deep we can go to the sun and uh, as far we can go from the sun. So um, if, you, if you take the... Uh, um, if, if, if we talk about the visible light wavelength, we can only see a bare sun. Um, you can see here with a with, uh, with few dots here and there, which are the uh, sunspots. Um, but if you would like to see what is going on in, in this solar plasma, we need to uh, we need to go a little bit lower in the in the wavelength and increase the frequency, and and then we start begin to see more details in the chromosphere. 
Okay. And uh, as we go smaller and smaller wavelength, we, we see more and more features in the solar problem. So uh, basically, as we are increasing the wavelength, in order to observe the sun, we are going away from the sun because uh, we, we, can, we, we begin to see um, the hotter and hotter plasma and hotter plasma is generally less dense and less dense plasma, hotter plasma is generally uh, finding away from the sun in the last part of the solar corona. So if one of the features which I'm going to talk about, which I'm going to focus on is, are these features um, on uh, here in the loops. These loops begin to appear in the um, solar atmosphere very often, especially when, uh, when there's a high solar activity. Um, so uh, the, the, the question is why we are seeing all these glow around the solar atmosphere and all these loops, what they tell us and uh, what they are about. So let's talk about them. Um, so basically the question here is why does the plasma, uh, so, so what we see basically magnetic lines of forces. These magnetic lines of forces are coming out of the surface of the sun and they are glowing. So the question is, um, what are they? So definitely uh, these magnetic lines of forces, we generally cannot see the magnetic lines of forces anywhere. So what we see actually is the plasma following these lines. Um, so the question is, what gives this loose this structure, this uh, these uh, this round structure, and also why does plasma has to follow the magnetic lines of forces? Um, so generally, we are going to understand this question uh, throughout this presentation. Um, if we want to understand it, we have to go down to the simplest of the um, simplest of the examples. So let's uh, let's say that um, that is um, so a little bit of plasma physics we talk about here. Uh, so let's say that we, we are in a, in a state of single particle picture where there's a single particle which is stuck in a magnetic field. Uh, magnetic field is represented by B and the particle has certain, certain charge. So um, this is, a, we, we can model this scenario in a couple of uh, different ways, but we are talking about a uh, simplest way because as we, as we go complex, we can talk about many complex things, but let's just uh, keep simple. So one way uh, uh, we can model things um, is to talk about how single charge particle, this, this charge particle uh, is moving um, around. And this is uh, what we call this a single particle picture. So uh, we are going to use this scenario to find out why plasma is stuck in the magnetic field lines first. And then uh, we are going to talk about magnetized plasma here, which is the extremely common in space. And uh, just like we have seen in the previous slide. So in this uh, single uh, particle picture, um, what happens to a charged plasma when you, when you have a magnetic field around? Well, the charged particle, let's say uh, it has a certain velocity, which is represented by this vector. Um, it has some direction and it will begin to feel the magnetic force, which is uh, provided by this magnetic field line. And this is the expression, uh, and this is the expression um, of the magnetic force, uh, generally known as Lorentz force. Um, and using the concept Lorentz force, we can calculate the force on the single charge particle, which may be given by the charge of the, um, of the particle times velocity, charge of the particle times velocity, we have a cross product of the, with the magnetic field. So as we know, the direction of the resulting vector is, is, is a cross product. Um, it's always directed towards uh, the perpendicular to uh, the these two vectors we are, we are going to talk, we are actually considering. Uh, that is the resulting force on the charge uh, as long as it remains in the influence on this magnetic field. So um, it is generally perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the, and, and the uh, man, uh, perpendicular uh, vector of, um, of, of, the, of the velocity. So it, it will point some, somewhere in the, in the magnetic field directions. Um, and in this situation, this particle begin to gyrate around. Obviously, it, it cannot go, it cannot leave this magnetic field because it's stuck and the and continuous, continuous force is applied on it uh, towards the magnetic field line. So it's, it's kind of feeling this force and start gyrating around this magnetic line of, uh, of force. So it, it cannot really move away in the direction it wants to go because it's the, the velocity vector is somewhere, somewhat in another direction. And uh, the final motion that we can see that this uh, 
particle would feel a go through is in, in somewhat like this. So what, what actually we see here is that um, the situation is, is, is schematically for an ion and electron. So obviously the bigger mass here is the ion, which you have a larger radius around, and the smaller mass is the electron, which is more tightly bound to the magnetic field. Uh, so, um, so we are, we are going to see in the next slide um, um, how we can calculate the radius and see. So there is no question that these these particles will remain uh, uh, stuck to this magnetic field as long as the magnetic field strength is there. Um, but the question is, um, what would be their radius and uh, what would be their uh, frequency? Uh, depending upon which type of uh, particle is actually uh, going around this magnetic field. So um, if you go a little bit into the mechanics, um, we, we, start, uh, we start with the, this uh, particle as a simple, simple picture of this uh, of the same scenario which we had in the previous slide uh, of, of this um, particle moving in the magnetic field. We try to uh, paint a, a rather simpler picture of how this is, it can be understood. So it, it starts with the, the current position of, of the particle here. Um, at some point, x and y, obviously, according to the, um, the coordinates. And uh, let the particle start, let, let, let consider that this particle start perpendicular motion, uh, having a vector v uh, perpendicular in this direction, in the negative y direction, and start going down this magnetic field. Um, so um, the solution of the x, x and y position would, would look like this. So uh, at any time, at any given time, the position of the x would be uh, um, will be given by the amplitude of the velocity divided by uh, the angular uh, gyro or a gyro frequency, which is omega g, uh, and times the cos of uh, minus omega g uh, multiplied by t. So this uh, this is a typical uh, way of how we can uh, how we can analyze uh, how we can find the uh, motion of the x obviously the y axis is uh, is perpendicular to the x axis so we have the sign uh, um, sign here for representing the uh, y axis motion so this describe um, a circular motion in the positive direction like this with an angular frequency omega g. So omega g is what we call the gyro frequency and the amplitude of the radius of the motion, which is which is sometimes called the Lama radius um, after the famous physicist. So I just call it a radio, um, we just call it a, a rho uh, or other radius of, of the motion of the particle in the magnetic field. Um, so we, we, we get to, we, we're going to see that how this gyro motion uh, uh, unfolds and how we can track this particle with this x and x and y motion um, as a simple kind of kinematics uh, we have used here. So, um, but this is not the only force uh, this uh, particle experience. This has a, this is a force which we have just uh, talked about, but obviously there's another uh, centripetal force which is equally uh, applied and in a similar direction uh, to uh, this force. So um, if you have a magnetic force and you assume that you have a circular motion around the magnetic field, then um, equal that magnetic force to the centripetal force, uh, which is given by the, uh, the multiple of uh, mass and velocity divided by the radius, um, is also equally present there. So we, we assume that we have an equilibrium between the two forces. Uh, and uh, uh, then we start solving for the row. So we get uh, this expression about the radius of uh, this particle, which is under the influence of the magnetic field moving around, which is experiencing not only the magnetic field force, but also uh, the force due to centripetal um, um, acceleration. Um, so, uh, so what we what we know here. So if you know the mass of the of the, of the particle, the velocity which is moving around. Um, and the magnetic field strength. So I, we can calculate um, where is the particle located and how far it is from the magnetic um, line of forces. But still there is no question that the, the particle is still under the influence of the magnetic field and keep going along the direction with the magnetic field. Um, we can also see from the expression that the stronger the mag uh, um, so what we can infer from here. So we, we, can, we can see that the stronger the magnetic field strength, the more tightly uh, the particle would be bound. 
Um, so what does it tell about, about the motion of these particles here? So if you look at them, um, the, the highly magnetic field here, obviously the, the, this electron is a smaller mass, so feel the magnetic force in a much, much uh, uh, larger way. And, and the ion is going around at a distance, but larger mass, so it feels the magnetic field in a, the, the, the influence of the magnetic field would be smaller on it. But at the same time, we see that the, 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 ratio, um, the radius of any particle in the, uh, magnet, the magnetic field would be larger if the mass of the particle is larger and vice versa if, the, if we have the magnetic field uh, larger. So it, it depends on which particle is in the magnetic field, whether it's a small particle, small mass would feel uh, more force and, and, and getting closer, tighter to the magnetic field and uh, larger mass would, would go around at, at a much larger distance. Um, we can also see, see from the expression that um, uh, similarly gy gyro frequency uh, in a similar way we can calculate uh, from these uh, simple uh, equations. Um, we have the we have the gyro radius, which is the multiple uh, comes from the mass uh, product of the mass and the velocity and the magnetic field. And uh, generally, um, uh, we have the so we, we, we know that for circular motion, the velocity of the, uh, of the particle uh, doing circular motion is equal to the angular frequency times the radius. So we, we have this particle which, which has, a, a, which, which velocity can be painted out uh, with the angular velocity and its radius. Uh, finally, we get expression of uh, what would be the angular frequency of the particle under the influence of this magnetic field. So, um, here, for out, out of these two expressions, I mean, I, uh, we, we can easily uh, understood that uh, if different particles behave different uh, way in this uh, in the influence of the magnetic field. So, if the magnetic, if the mass of the particle is greater, um, it will be more tightly bound to the magnetic field line. Um, but if the influence of the magnetic field is greater. Uh, on the particles, we have a much uh, larger frequency that uh, the particle uh, has will go with. So, in, uh, taking the example of the two particles, one is the ion, which is uh, which is with a bigger mass here, and one is electron, which is smaller mass here. Uh, the smaller mass are tightly bound to the magnetic field and having a larger frequency, and uh, the bigger mass have uh, um, a certain magnetic field force on it, and then it, it has a larger uh, radius um, around the magnetic field line. Um, so if, if, we, if we consider a big picture, uh, we see uh, up till now, we just consider one magnetic line of force and see uh, two, uh, two different charge particles uh, behaving in a single line of uh, magnetic force. But if we have, if we, if we paint this picture in a, in a in a in an area where multiple magnetic lines of forces are present and multiple plasma bodies are gyrating around the magnetic lines of forces, this is what we can see in a magnetized plasma. That is, if there is the, if there is a velocity in that direction along the magnetic field, the velocity will keep constant along the uh, magnetic lines of forces. So these these uh, uh, particles keep gyrating in a, in a constant uh, velocity. But the direction is along, always along the magnetic lines of forces. So they are kind of stuck where they are. So whoever is in whichever line of force, it, it's kind of uh, it has just one option to go around, which is the along the magnetic line of force. So they cannot go uh, uh, in the perpendicular direction of the uh, mag mag magnetic field line. Um, that drastically changed some of the plasma property because the, the plasma behave very differently when they move along the magnetic field lines compared to how they move perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, that movement of plasma is said to be anisotropic, since it behaves just in, 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 in one in different way in a different directions. So it has along the field line, it has a different movement and across the field line, it has different movement. So, um, so for example, what, what does it tell us? I mean, if, if I want to draw current, I want to calculate current in this magnetic field, um, it would be very easy to draw the current along the moving charge, moving charge particles, which is parallel to the magnetic field line. 
uh, because the particles can move very easily along, along this direction. But it's very, very difficult to find uh, the, the current um, in this plasma across the magnetic field line. So ideally, there would be no current perpendicular to the magnetic field line. This phenomenon is, is actually uh, commonly um, known as the electrical conductivity of the plasma. And uh, that's very commonly uh, present in, in our upper atmosphere, the charge from it, which is called the ionosphere. Um, so from here, understanding that the, the plasma is stuck in this way because of this, uh, the, the influence of the magnetic field, certain plasma is stuck in certain magnetic field lines. Um, we, 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 can, we can answer um, why does this plasma actually follow the magnetic field line. So um, due to the gyro motion, obviously charged uh, charge plasma stuck in line. And since they have to be stuck and they have to move along on the same lines, um, uh, they look like, uh, and they have to move around forward and backward. Um, secondly, the density of the plasma stuck in the coronal uh, loops, it emit more in those regions. So we can have some brighter region. It means that the density of the magnetic field lines here compared to the other parts, uh, for example, here are different. That's why we have much brighter um, look of this picture uh, uh, in an area uh, where the magnetic field lines are more denser uh, compared to magnetic field lines which are more uh, less denser. Um, in some of the coronal loops, uh, each of these loops are here are, are considered se se separate coronal loops. So in some of the coronal loops, because of this scenario that uh, the plasma can not move across the field line, I always have to follow. Um, hot and, and dense plasma always stuck here. Okay, unless there's something to change this situation and the loop breaks up which we see in, in, the, in the phenomena in uh, plasma physics that these loops breaks up. That, the only, that is the only condition when this plasma which is stuck in these, in these magnetic field lines can leave and uh, become uh, the part of the solar wind or uh, travel to another part. Otherwise, as long as these loops are intact, the, the plasma will keep moving, gyrating around different magnetic field lines up and down across these loops. So, um, um, so in basically, different since there are different ways to describe uh, the plasma, we, um, we, we look at the single particle picture by now. But if you talk about a little bit uh, greater mass, let's talk about plasma elements. So uh, these, um, so we, we begin to think more on a large scale, for example, the properties of plasma, we think of it as a gas similar to the aerodynamics. So plasma is basically a gas as we have uh, discussed in the starting point. And uh, so we have, to, we have to treat mass of the gas. If you, if, you, if, you, if you go beyond the single particle, we have to treat it as something flowing and we have to talk about aerodynamics anyway. So, and, this, and the source of, of a way to describe how magnetic fields organize the plasma and fluid description will, will come into play. Um, it is something called, uh, called frozen in magnetic field line, this theorem. And, um, we can understand it by, by these simple scenarios. So let's say there are two plasma elements going along a magnetic field line. Let's say at time T1, they are uh, A and B at this stage. And after some time, at time T2, um, although the field lines reshape, and, uh, but they are going to be the same field lines, they keep uh, the plasma elements A and B keep moving in the elements. So they, they have nowhere to go, no matter whether these V lines keep their shape intact or not, as long as um, uh, this, this theorem holds. So, uh, so basically uh, what this theorem is about, this theorem is, uh, it has to tell, uh, tell us that uh, we have a magnetic Reynolds number. So, um, this Reynolds, the, the, if the Reynolds, uh, this Reynolds number is actually um, given by uh, four quantities of the plasma matter which is stuck in the field line. So um, 
as long uh, so it, it, it involves the permeability of the free space. So basically it is um, the constant of proportionality between the magnetic flux and the magnetic field strength. Um, the electric conductivity of the plasma we are talking about, the length scale, which is kind of vague, but depending upon where we are in this space, uh, for example, if you are close to, uh, to the sun surface, the, the length scale would be different. If we are away from the sun, which where the plasma is flowing in a straight line, the length uh, uh, scale would be different. And also the velocity of the plasma. If this number combined to give us a number which is much, much greater than one, which is called the magnetic Reynolds number, the plasma would never escape from the field line, no matter what happened to the field line, how they de-shape, how they reshape, and uh, whether they bent, whether they get straighter, as long as this Reynolds number holds, um, and holds in a way that it, it's, it's, it's a multiple is much, much greater than one, we keep the plasma stuck in the magnetic field lines. And uh, this basically is, is, the, is, it a, is defined by, um, on the science, science, uh, by a scientist, uh, let's go forward, um, Hannes Elwain, which was a, a sorry, scientist, he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, for his work on this, so let's let's get a, a little bit better explanation of what uh, what this frozen magnetic field line theorem. So if we if we go beyond the single uh, single line, single magnetic line, of course, and talking about a uh, much greater plasma which is flowing in a in a flux tube. So let's say we have a flux tube, we have several magnetic lines of forces passing through, and uh, we have certain certain flux phi going through each surface uh, where the beam magnetic lines of forces are going through. As long as this frozen magnetic field theorem holds, we get the situation that flux never change. So flux cannot enter into the tube, and flux cannot go out of this tube. Everything, uh, uh, all the plasma elements which are going along this, uh, these magnetic lines in this tube will remain intact and remain frozen in, in, in the fields inside this tube. So, so basically for the frozen magnetic field theorem, we have two conditions. One, number one is that as long as the Reynolds number, the A would be much, much greater than one. And as long as the, uh, the, the phi um, does not change over time. So how, how this can be more understood in a better way. So we, if we consider a flux tube, which has certain surfaces and certain uh, lines of uh, magnetic lines of forces going around. And if we consider that all these surfaces have this, this similar, exactly similar uh, flux, because obviously the same, same lines of forces are going along, no matter what happened to this tube, uh, it's D-shape or reshape, um, the flux would never leave or the external flux would never enter because which whatever uh, uh, plasma particles which are going along these magnetic lines of forces, they only have one direction to go, which is along the magnetic lines of forces. So no matter how D-shaped this tube would be, uh, the plasma would never leave or the external plasma, plasma would never enter into this tube. Uh, if you talk about infinitely small uh, tube, which is considering one single line, which we have considered before, and the elements which are going uh, across this line because of those mechanics which we have discussed about, um, this plasma will, hold, will will keep its presence into the magnetic field, and keep frozen into the magnetic field going up and down, but cannot leave these lines as long as the magnetic Reynolds number is greater than one. Uh, we have the situation of frozen and magnetic field lines uh, forever. This is kind of a situation and, uh, um, which, which, we have, which we encounter in Meissner effect in a superconductor where we cannot penetrate magnetic lines of forces into any superconductor and we can easily balance um, a superconductor uh, the, the gravitational force of the superconductor applied on the superconductor is easily balanced with the magnetic, uh, magnetic force if we apply in the opposite direction of the gravity, uh, something that can be uh, seen in this picture. So this is, this is a similar situation. So no, no flux would enter, no flux would leave. 
and whatever uh, uh, plasma is is going along these fields will remain there as long as uh, we have Banner's number greater than than one. So this is uh, this is given by the uh, Hannes Alvain, which he got Nobel Prize for uh, in 1917. Now, um, if we look at different pictures from the space, we see all these ones are, are actually showing the same theorem uh, and the same state, but in different ways. So we see different populations painting out here or with painting out different plasma population in different fashions. And there may be a different plasma population on different magnetic lines of forces that are stuck and they may have different emissive properties. Obviously different colors is, is representative of what the emissive, emissive properties are. And the, the, the density of the plasma is, is represented by how, um, how dense these lines, uh, the, these pictures are. Um, so this is how we can experience the phenomena uh, practically uh, when we actually take this picture, which is showing magnetic lines of forces here and there and keeping this plasma uh, stuck in there uh, in, in the magnetic lines of forces. But there's another question comes out. Um, that is, um, there, there are basically two, two things we are talking about here. One is plasma and magnetic, mag, mag, magnetic uh, lines of forces. Um, but the question is, does it always happen that magnetic lines of forces capture the plasma and plasma is stuck in those lines? Or sometime plasma can drag these lines apart and take the magnetic field along with itself. So um, is, is these two situations true or there's only one situation then since, uh, since there are uh, particle density of certain type available near the magnetic field and, and they are stuck in the magnetic field and always keep there. Um, actually, both situations are perfectly, uh, um, and perfectly be observed in this space. It's all about the plasma pressure or magnetic field pressure. So, so the plasma pressure we can calculate is about what is the number density of the plasma particles per uh, meter uh, per cubic meter, um, the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. The multiple of it de 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 decide what is the plasma pressure, and obviously the, the, um, the magnetic field pressure is defined by the magnetic field strength and, and perme uh, perme permittivity um, permeability of the space. When we take a ratio of, of the plasma pressure to the magnetic field pressure, we actually define a magnetic beta. And this magnetic beta, in that scenario where this plasma and, and the magnetic lines are, are present, defines who will rule on who. So if, the, if this magnetic beta is much, much less than one, then it will be the magnetic field strength, which is stronger, and then plasma was stuck into the magnetic field and moving around up and down all, all, all the time stuck there. But if the magnetic uh, um, uh, beta number is much, much greater than one, then the, 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 uh, the plasma has such a great strength and pressure and it drags magnetic lines of forces along it and uh, move it with, with it. Um, so how, how and where we can observe uh, these two scenarios. Um, so basically, let's take the example of, of comets. Uh, so plasma element on one magnetic field line stuck in that uh, magnetic field line uh, for hours. So we, we have already seen it. So this helps to understand um, the, the qualitatively certain phenomenon space like, uh, like this in this uh, comet situation. Um, so the sun emits solar, solar wind, which carries with it the magnetic field which is frozen into the, uh, to the solar wind. And when this solar wind plasma reaches the plasma surrounding the comet, it interacts with the gas surrounding the comet, which is ionized by the sunlight and create a plasma environment around the comet. Okay, so um, before this, 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 uh, this, this, um, uh, this solar wind reaches it, uh, the sun ionizes the plasma around um, this comet, and when the magnetic field lines uh, reach there, they cannot enter. Okay? And 
what they do is like they start to drape around this this uh, this plasma structure, which is basically um, a, a comet in the space, and which is, whose surrounding is actually ionized uh, through the, um, the sun um, uh, energy. So they start draping around rather than going through it, just like uh, we could not see uh, we could not see the magnetic field uh, going into the flux tube or uh, in case of the superconductor. Uh, this kind of scenario is not only present with the comet, so we can observe this that this type of tail in, in, this, in this simulation that we can see always present around the comet, which is an example of um, how the plasma can drag the magnetic fields around uh, with it and which cannot enter into the plasma and drive it and, and, and make it stuck in, in its lines. Uh, we also have this scenario on Venus and Mars, uh, which, which have a very weak magnetosphere. Uh, the other situation, we can, uh, we can see when, when basically um, the differential motion of the, of the sun. So sun differentially move, and uh, differential movement means the equator of the sun is moving much faster than the uh, the polar mass of, of the sun. So since since it's a, it's a big sphere of gas, it's it's not a very solid body that that moves uh, uh, equally uh, on top to bottom. So at some point in time, when the plasma flash pressure increases, start dragging the magnetic field around it, and it start pulling these magnetic lines of forces. And what we see is something like we can see on on the GIF on the right. So the, the magnetic lines of forces are so stretched and, and so scrambled that they, they, they need a, a final escape. So um, what we start seeing is that they start coming out of the surface of the sun and we start seeing those coronal loops going out of the surface of the sun. And then finally they take this plasma out uh, along the field line. So what we see finally is that uh, because of this, uh, the extraordinary pressure provided by the plasma, the magnetic field lines are dragged by the plasma and then uh, come out of the surface of the sun and bringing that plasma, which is stuck around these magnetic field lines. Now, this uh, also uh, gives us another uh, point that why we see these black spots on the, on the surface of the sun. When the, when the loops are uh, shown or the loops are visible, it's just because when the, these these magnetic fields because of it, because of the complicated structure coming out of the surface of the sun, uh, they actually disturb those convection cells uh, underneath them, and the plasma could not reach on the surface of the sun and at the points where these lines are coming out and dragging the plasma, uh, which is stuck in these lines, out of the surface of the sun. So. Um, so this is another situation where we see the plasma is dragging the magnetic field lines uh, rather than uh, the, the, uh, the plasma is stuck into the magnetic field lines. Um, just going further into, uh, into uh, to understanding of um, how the situation can be in the interplanetary space. So if we, if we have been talking about uh, a situation where um, the, the plasma and the magnetic field is working together. So, but we are we, we have certain scenarios in in our um, space where, as we go away from the central body, uh, we start seeing different behavior from the um, plasma and and the magnetic field that it carries. So let's see what happens um, to the solar wind when when uh, leaving the surface of the sun. Uh, so so this is the perspective of the sun from its pole side. So the the, the, re the red line here. This, this line is actually magnetic, uh, magnetic loop moving out of the equatorial plane and the moving into the equatorial plane. So it looks like a line, uh, magnetic line, of course, connecting these two plasma particles, but actually it is a, a magnetic loop. So the magnetic field is frozen into the solar wind. Um, these two plasma elements here will forever be connected as long as there is no uh, reconnection process. But now imagine the, the sun is rotating. So it starts rotating. Um, and at a later stage, this plasma element, which was stuck here on the, on the sun, um, would have rotated a little to the left side 
because of the the movement when when was when the previous uh, plasma element was leaving it was about this position and then it moved down to the left side because of the uh, anti clockwise movement and with the rotation of the sun while the first plasma element is just now moving finally radially outward from the sun so this plasma element is leaving although but they are still very well, much connected because they both are stuck in the magnetic field line and they will remain there unless there are something uh, uh, some dissociation uh, phenomenon come and, and, and break them. So this will begin to tense up the magnetic field and begin to deform this magnetic field. Uh, further, uh, to uh, looking into the scenario, at a later stage, the sun emits the second plasma element into, into the wind and both those plasma elements would still be connected. So all these three would be still be connected as long as uh, we have this um, frozen and magnetic field line theorem holds. Dr. Uh, Mabashar, five minutes, inshallah. Okay. So uh, and no matter how, how many rotations the sun take, these two will, st will stuck in this magnetic field line and, and can stay forever as long as they are uh, in um, hold the scenario. So this way we actually begin to see an spiral formation. So what this spiral formation would be, um, this is generally known as the uh, particle spiral, uh, the formation of this magnetic line, which are, um, basically we started, we, we begin to see in the previous slide. Um, we see that they all are connected no matter where the, uh, the first plasma element is going, as long as they are connected uh, and frozen in the magnetic field, they, they, uh, they, they keep connected. So after some time, what we see is that all these uh, loops start forming and making a, a complete spiral. And in each of the, uh, on each of the line of this loop, all the lines, they are actually the loops themselves. So basically, how these loops are formed, they, they leave the surface of the sun and after some time, they come back to the surface of the sun. But all the elements, just like this, all the elements are still connected on these loops, whether they are, so if you, if you look at the sideways, we see this, this is the surface of the sun and this is the loop going out of the sun and coming back to the sun through the equator. Um, they always are connected and these magnetic field lines we always come back to the surface of the sun and they pull them all the plasma which they are carrying always is stuck in the magnetic field and as long as the magnetic field line theorem uh, frozen magnetic field line theorem holds finally if we if you paint the whole magnetic field around the sun in the interplanetary space we see a kind of a solar ballerina skirt i mean that that that's moving up and down depending upon the plasma movement that is stuck in the magnetic field and then carrying the magnetic field around out in the uh, outer space. Sometimes this, this, uh, this field is meeting the earth magnetic field in the positive direction like north-south and sometimes it, uh, it meets the uh, earth magnetic field in south-north direction. So basically this is, this is where we uh, start having the geomagnetic storm. So it depends how the field of magnetic uh, of, of the solar wind meets the magnetic field of the earth, we have either solar storms effect on the earth or not. So whenever the, uh, the sun magnetic field meets in the south north direction with the, with the earth's magnetic field, we see a geomagnetic storm effects and we have a much stronger ionosphere um, underneath it. So yeah, this is a, a, a schematic of how this can be looked like starting from center which, which is the position of the sun and going away uh, from the sun. Um, so that's all by me, uh, although it's a, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to be uh, uh, talking about very quickly and moving on things very quickly, but due to the limited time, um, I could not spend a lot of time on, on one single thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mabashar. So uh, I'll give a floor for two or three questions. We have a question through a chat. Uh, let, if you can see it, uh, Dr. Mabashar, what are the ionized gases made up of in the corona of the uh, loop of the sun and the aurora in, in Earth? Sorry, let me, um, let me open it. What are the ionized gases made up of the, in the corona loop of the sun? And the aurora in Earth. Uh, well, um, 
these these gases are basically the gases which are in the in the atmosphere. They exist in the atmosphere of of the sun all the time. It's just that the ultraviolet rays ionize them, and ultraviolet rays they are uh, before they absorb completely from the upper atmosphere, they ionize the gases, uh, and uh, uh, and they ionize them. I mean, the the, the plasma is there. But the similar gases which are present in the in the atmosphere always they are just it is a matter of being ionized and non-ionized. Unionized gases are stay under 90 kilometer above the earth's surface. And the aurora is seen by this magnetic uh, frozen magnetic line field line theorem when uh, when it follows the magnetic lines and glow in the uh, in the ionosphere above us. So I don't know if it's answered the question. So because uh, um, well, to, to add up to add up to your answer, these ionized gases are made of what? Are made of protons, electrons for the corona, yeah. and so for the aurora, it's just uh, hydrogen excited, oxygen excited. So that's why we see this aurora in this uh, beautiful color, oxygen, uh, also oxygen. We see them in blue and uh, green and red and so on. So different types of particles. Any other question, please? You can chat or you can just speak out. Uh, I believe what you presented, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Mopter, is uh, good for my student because some of some of my students are attending, and uh, we are in chapter eight talking about the sun. Uh, so it is a good review for them, even though it is more uh, more uh, more in details than we see in uh, our general astronomy course. Any question, please? Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you for our visitor. Thank you for the student who attended, and hopefully you benefited a lot. So thank you very much, and see you for our next uh, lecture. It will be this coming uh, Sunday, eight. It will be about uh, Martian habitat. And we're going to have Professor Camilo from the American University of Sharjah give us a talk. So we'll see you then, inshallah. Thank you very much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Dr. Mubashir. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.